Welcome to Film at 50, a podcast that celebrates some centennials in the world of cinema. I'm your host, Brian Rowe, and I'm very thrilled to welcome Sophia Simonello from Oscar Wilde to the podcast today to talk about a movie that did not get any Oscar nominations, but it is directed by the great Martin Scorsese, who I feel like he's been to the Oscars a few times, right, Sophia? Yeah, you know, he's been a few times. I don't know if he's won for his best film, but I'm sure you can get to that way down the line. <laughs> yes, I'm very excited after a year and a half of Film with 50 to finally talk about Martin Scorsese today. Uh, he had done a couple things before Boxcar Bertha. He obviously worked on Woodstock from 1970, which won the Oscar for Best Documentary. And then his first feature, Who's That Knocking at My Door, which I'm never quite sure, like, when was that official release date? I, know, I think it played at the Chicago film festival in 67 as mm -hmm. i call first i believe was the first title yeah you know much about the, his first movie <laughs> i always just associate it with that that release date because i think that the big thing there was that scorsese was kind of known as this festival darling mm. which was how he got this project and then of course this project and roger corman and everything mm. that goes along with it that we will talk about <laughs> totally paves the way for Mean Streets and the rest of his career and what he'll get into. So I think I always associate it with that period with the late yeah. 60s and with the festivals. I always find it really fascinating about filmmakers is that one project most often leads to the next in terms of like, mm -hmm. if they hadn't made this movie, good or bad, indifferent, whatever, sometimes that next maybe masterpiece hadn't happened. And that's, I watched a couple of clips this morning before we came on here and someone was talking about how like without boxcar bertha there would not have been mean streets and then you're like huh right mm -hmm. yeah. you're like you're like how does that work in terms of if just one of his early films hadn't have happened mm -hmm. some of these great movies we all love today maybe some of them would have gotten made but we'll never know right it's such an interesting path <laughs> right i love thinking about that with directors because it really is it's all about the relationships that you have with, you know, people in the industry, with other filmmakers and those chances that you take along the way. I mean, that's what leads to the films that make you, you in the case of right. Scorsese. And as we know, of course, he has paved the way for so many filmmakers today around the world. So it's cool to see his origins as well. Absolutely. And I feel like of all the films he's made, obviously there have been a few that might not be as well known to people. Like mm -hmm. I always think of Kunden, that's, that's yep. one that maybe not everybody knows, mm -hmm. but I feel like if you were to ask someone who even knows a lot about Scorsese, Boxcar Bertha is not going to be at the top of their titles they know. <laughs> so. Definitely not. I mean, I, I'm a big Scorsese nut, I would say. I try to like keep up with him, and I'm a big fan of a lot of his films, but this mm -hmm. was the first time that I had Yay. watched Boxcar Bertha, so thank you for inviting me on to cross this movie off of my Scorsese filmography list and to talk about it with you today. I'm very excited to have you, Sophia. I'm a huge fan of Oscar Wilde. I Thank loved you. your uh, your season finale episode where you <laughs> articulated so well my exact feelings about the ceremony. <laughs> oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, I'm happy that other people could commiserate with me and with my co-host Nick about just... <laughs> everything that happened that terrible night and why it was just such a downer for <laughs> film fans everywhere it was really sad yeah so I have a new YouTube channel called Brian Rowe video where I did a lot of videos about the Oscars leading up to the show mm -hmm. and when you put months of time into thinking about every category and then you get a show like that and you're just like it was very deflating yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh my god absolutely deflating and you just you put it so well it's like when you spend so much time thinking about something and then and caring about it and you realize that the people who are <laughs> responsible for making this event a success and for honoring the films of the year they don't really care about it it seems that's really hard it's a hard <laughs> pill to swallow <laughs> so quick question i was just looking at some clips this morning so when they had the eight categories that were presented before the live show mm -hmm. they they when you see it like they cut two shots of people in the audience clapping uh -huh. And it looks like some of it's people who were on the red carpet. So did they edit that in later? Do we know? Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> because I mean, they show at one point Benedict Cumberbatch and yeah. his wife, Sophie, who are in their exact seats from the Dolby, from the right. ceremony. They weren't at that pre-show. So you know that's <laughs> cut in. 
which to me, and I said this on my show too, like that indicates that they know that they made a mistake. Like they're, <laughs> they're adding that in as editing. It's like, come on guys, you know, these should be part of the regular telecast. It's so awkward. It reminds me mm-hmm. of when uh, Tracy Ullman came out to uh, speak at Meryl Streep's AFI Lifetime Achievement Award in 2004. And she's, I don't know if you've seen that clip of her. She is mm-hmm. absolutely hilarious. And then it cuts to shots of the audience. And at one point it cuts to a shot and behind Charlie's Theron laughing, there's Tracy Ullman clapping, looking <laughs> oh up God. during Tracy Ullman's speech. And I'm like, wait. <laughs> uh, truly, I mean, that's just one of those great flubs. I haven't watched that in a while, but it goes, I feel like it goes around on Twitter every so often where I'm just like, oh my God, I can't, I cannot relive this. <laughs> like rule of thumb for editors. Like if you're going to mm-hmm. cut to reaction shots, that didn't happen at the exact same moment. Just yeah. double check that the person talking on the stage is not in the, in the background of the audience. <laughs> I always love that. But yeah, mm-hmm. so before we get into Boxcar Bertha, if you could just talk a little bit about kind of your history with film and what films mean to you. If you have a few favorites you could share with us, that would be fantastic. Of course. Yeah. So film has been really everything to me for as long as I can remember. Um, my mom actually went into labor with me shortly after seeing Jurassic Park <laughs> that like kind of kickstarted everything. So that's kind of my first film story really there, but you know, my parents are big movie people and Mm -hmm. we always had TCM on in the house growing up. It was always on in my grandparents' house. So I really, I think, found a love of old Hollywood films Mm -hmm. very early on. Um, In particular, I remember when I turned 10, that was when I was allowed at the library to check out movies, which was a big deal. And I remember my first movie that I got out was Sunset Boulevard, which is like- My favorite film. Oh, there we go. Yeah. I mean, one of my favorite films and at age 10, you rented that. Mm -hmm. Yep. I remember because my, our librarian at school recommended it to me because she knew that I had this like old Hollywood bug, um, in my head and I had to watch it and I just loved it. I'm sure, you know, I didn't understand it as well then as I do now, but I just, I was so just thrown by the glamour and Gloria Swanson and everything Mm -hmm. about it. I loved it. Um, Other films I love from that period. I really love All About Eve. Mm -hmm. I love Brief Encounter. I love Double Indemnity. Really love all of those films. And then I would say too, I mean, growing up, my parents would take my sister and me to movies all the time. We really, I think, loved the theater experience, you know, going to the movies and I, of course, just went all the time, but then I think somewhere down the line too, because my dad was really into the seventies and the movies from that period, I started really loving those, um, definitely love Robert Altman. So I love Nashville. Mm. I love McCabe and Mrs. Miller. And I have to mention just two other favorites from that period, Barry Lyndon and Chinatown, some of my favorites (laughs) Mm -hmm. and recent favorite film as in like from the past few years, I really love Phantom Thread. I talk about it all the time. I'm a big thread head. So (laughs) I would say like, that's how I got into movies. And those are some that I would recommend. Phantom Thread was, uh, you knew within five minutes, you were like, I mean, I, I definitely felt mm-hmm. that with Phantom Thread, just like you were in the hands of a master. And oh, yeah. walking in, I believe, didn't we know walking in that this was, according to Daniel Day-Lewis, was his last film? So there was mm-hmm. there was that sense, too, of like, wow, this could be it. Like, this could be the last yeah. one. So that right. made it even more enriching, I felt, yeah. because it's such a beautiful film, uh, regardless of whether he was retiring or not. Right. Exactly. Yeah. On June 20th, Daniel Day Lewis announced that he was retiring of that year. It was a very (laughs) (laughs) tragic day for me as a Daniel Day Lewis stan. So I remember that well. So yeah, yeah, there was a lot of expectation there, but I knew nothing about Vicky Crepes, the woman who played Mm. Alma Mm -hmm. going into it. So I was really just, I loved her performance. I loved that character and Leslie Manville as Cyril, of course, too. Mm. Just the cinematography, the sound work, Johnny Greenwood's score absolutely love it. I think it's a 10 yeah. out of 10. Yeah. You have great taste in film and that's why I tune into your podcast you. all the time because I know, <laughs> I know you're not going to say like ambulance. Let's start talking Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jake, no Gyllenhaal, shade on ambulance. Maybe I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of hard to talk about next year's Oscars. I'm still mm-hmm. kind of like processing <laughs> the show <laughs> from a oh, few yeah. weeks ago. So I'm Me like, too. you know, I mean, there's a couple things coming out, but I, I feel like before Elvis, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> it's right. kind of hard, I mean, it's kind of hard to one. predict. Yeah. 
for, uh, totally. by, by Lerman. Yeah. And I'm happy that you had me on too, because now I'm just like, I'm fully in my, my bag, which is like seventies cinema <laughs> and like classic Hollywood where I'm like, I'm totally ignoring the new stuff for now until I have to talk about it come Oscar time. So I'm very happy to, you know, live in this world and yeah. watch movies from this period. Yeah. There kind of is that pressure, especially in February, mm-hmm. March to really just live in that world of the now. Exactly. And mm-hmm. it's, it's, it was nice for me during that time to keep doing this podcast and like yeah. set a day a week, like, Oh, oh no, okay. We're going to look at a film from 72 and, mm-hmm. and, you know, and we've looked at so many great films this year, like the Godfather and Cabaret and some really, mm-hmm. r- really interesting year for film. And that like the big ones came out at the beginning of the year. We don't really mm-hmm. see that now. Like of the two films that were kind of neck and neck, like leading up to the next Oscars that come out in February and March, that'd be kind of a surprise, right? <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. When I've seen those anniversaries come up, you know, I'm, I'm seeing cabaret in theaters for the first time in oh. a few weeks. So I'm very excited for that. But yeah, seeing those anniversaries, like the Godfather and cabaret early in the year, is just interesting from a, stor- a historical perspective, yeah. thinking about the Oscars. Yeah. That Godfather reunion. <laughs> oh man. Well, you know, we on Oscar Wilde with Robert De Niro <laughs> episode coming. And I hope that oh, we yes. did it justice compared to whatever was happening at the Oscars <laughs> with God love him, Robert De Niro, who is not in the Godfather. <laughs> that was my tweet in that moment. I said, I hate to be mm-hmm. that guy. De Niro is not in the Godfather. <laughs> I mean, somebody has to do it. So I appreciate that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so really important year for film. And I would call, you know, this entry an important entry because of it being mm-hmm. the first real like Hollywood film by Scorsese. So let's get into Boxcar Bertha. Uh, we t- chatted a little bit before we started recording, but uh, had you seen this before? Had you heard of this movie before? I had heard of this movie before, okay. but what's interesting, you know, I had never seen it. And part of that was because I had always its reputation kind of precedes it. I mm-hmm. think a lot of people talk about this film as lesser Scorsese. Yeah. It was, you know, before Mean Streets, which mm-hmm. is his, you know, big solo Scorsese venture when he can really make the film that he wants to make. Right. And I think because of that, I had, you know, maybe subconsciously avoided it or just hadn't mm-hmm. prioritized seeing it. So I was happy to have an excuse to watch <laughs> it and I don't know if I agree that it's lesser Scorsese, you know, it's, it's not his grand epics that we get later on <laughs> yeah. and it doesn't have a wild budget like you had for the Wolf of Wall Street or the Irishman, but <laughs> I think you can see traces of that Scorsese that mm-hmm. we know um, in the movie, but you can definitely see a little bit more of Roger Corman. Yeah, there. I agree. Mm-hmm. Well, so this is produced by Roger Corman, who was known for cranking out his films you know I think mm-hmm. what Little Shop of Horrors was cranked out in two days if I believe yeah it's it's <laughs> insane when you think about it and this like, one's quick too yeah like I made a I made films in college in two days but they'd be like nine minutes long <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know, not, yeah not, mm-hmm. not 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 an hour and a half but mm-hmm. yeah I think part of the reason I also kind of avoided Box Heart for a while because it was produced by Roger Corman and it's a historical film I thought oh that's probably kind of a cheaply made exploitation movie that mm-hmm. he, where he's just a director for hire. It's not going to have anything Scorsese in it. It doesn't seem like like essential viewing uh, for right. Scorsese fans. And I'm happy I finally got to watch it, at least in full. I might have seen pieces of it before, maybe in college, but I, I'd never seen it all the way through. And it had some weaknesses here and there. But for the mm-hmm. most part, I was I, I was really impressed with what he pulled off in 24 shooting days in Arkansas with a $600,000 budget. And I mean, comparing this to Who's That Knocking at My Door, which also has some great stuff in it, but it's very like experimental indie, black and white. Like he has come a long way with this one, I thought. I agree. I think that he he has really come a long way from that. And I feel, yes, there are, you know, there's sex and violence and <laughs> all of those hallmarks of your traditional exploitation film that Corman would crank out, right? These were to get teenagers to go to the movies. And how do you do that? You put (laughs) sex and violence and nudity in your movies. And there is certainly that there, but, you know, hearing from, you know, reading interviews from Barbara Hershey and from people involved at the time, like they cite Scorsese and his influence here as making it feel a little bit different Mm -hmm. and why they enjoyed actually working on the film. So I think it definitely is a step up for him, but Mm -hmm. also it 
it's still, it's not quite there, but you can see where he's going, which I think that's always cool for a filmmaker. And I think he includes a shot and we'll, you know, we'll work through the movie. I'm not going to get to the end right away, but the the ending is amazing. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there's a bit in the end where I'm like, oh my God, Scorsese and his Catholicism. There it is right in front of you. (laughs) Yeah. We'll get to the ending where I'm like, wait, is Mm -hmm. this my, did I put on the last temptation of Christ? (laughs) You're like, are you sure? I mean, Barbara Hershey's in that too. So, (laughs) which also has Hershey Mm -hmm. really wild. Like, I mean, I, I, I like, did he, was he thinking about that when he, cast Hershey and Last Temptation of Christ you know, 15, 16 I years feel later. That's definitely possible. I feel like that's how his brain works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the first thing I did when I, I really enjoyed her performance and I was like, has mm-hmm. she been in another Scorsese film? It didn't come to me right away. Mm-hmm. And then, I'm like, oh, right. She's in Last Temptation mm-hmm. of Christ. Very interesting. Had you seen his uh, debut feature before? Who's that knocking at my I door? Have. have you seen that? What do you think yes. of his first I film? I watched... Um, I, I haven't seen it in years, it's been a while. so I don't, it's been a while. That was one where I watched it sort of on a whim, um, when I was first getting into Scorsese. And mm. I think also, you know, it is strong still, like there are parts of him there, but it is, I would, I mean, I consider it to be weaker definitely than this one yeah. and certainly than later films of his mm. where he's fully tapped into, I think who he is as right. a filmmaker. I do think it's cool his first feature from 67 has Harvey Keitel in the lead role and it Mm -hmm. deals with some themes that he would go on to explore in Mean Streets in 73. Mm -hmm. So I do think, like, I feel like both Who's at Knocking at My Door and Boxcar Bertha are kind of essential viewing to see the beginning of his career because they're both Mm -hmm. wildly different. But Who's at Knocking at My Door feels more like Mean Streets, whereas Boxcar Bertha is this kind of other thing that's not really anything like any of his other films that he would make, at least in the 70s. So definitely. And I think there is an impulse there to pair who's that knocking at my door in Mean Streets. Right. Um, whether it's thematically or because of that casting mm-hmm. choice of Harvey Keitel, and people do, including me. I mean, forget that Boxcar Bertha is in the center. In that. the middle. So to understand, <laughs> right, the future of him, you do have to watch that. So yeah. I also find it interesting that Scorsese was forced into having nudity in both Who's That Knocking at My Door and Boxcar Bertha. Like mm-hmm. it's really kind of shocking at the beginning of Boxcar when we get. Barbara Hershey nudity that feels like it doesn't need to be there at all. And then you read about it later and he was forced into that. He, he did not necessarily want to have nudity in the movie. Right. Well, what's funny there is some part of me is like, Scorsese, do I believe you? Because, you know, later on we get even more movies with more nudity from him where <laughs> I doubt anyone was pressuring him to include it. But I will <laughs> say true. for this one, <laughs> what I read that I thought was funny was that Scorsese, he thought of this movie as a crash course in the realities of the marketplace is what he said. So learning about like how to work with producers and work with people like that. But he said he imitated Corman and he quoted, he said, he didn't apologize for that. This is what we do. Every 15 pages in the script, there should be a suggestion of nudity, which is just like, when you think of those exploitation films, it's like, sometimes that nudity and the violence feels pointless it's like okay we're just putting this in here to get shock out of our audience and when you have something like that like an arbitrary every 15 pages or so that's (laughs) just well what is what does suggestion of nudity even mean i mean doesn't that technically mean it doesn't have to have any like it's a suggestion is not it has to be (laughs) exactly and i i do feel like this movie i mean there is some nudity in it of course but to me I think compared to other exploitation films from the period it doesn't feel like it was that gratuitous um and part of that could be because you know Barbara Hershey and David Carradine were in a relationship at Mm -hmm. the time right um of filming and they they have said like that this it wasn't forced no (laughs) one faked anything which is hilarious like it goes right into that but yeah Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think there's necessarily too much for what you might expect from a Corman film at the time. Yeah. It's not like every 15, 20 minutes we're getting a sex scene or something. It's not like, you know, the room with Tommy Wiseau and we have to have a sex scene. every. (laughs) (laughs) Right. And it's, I mean, too, I think Scorsese does use pretty creative camera work in some of those scenes, right? You get close-ups and you get editing that is that feels more suggestive but it doesn't Mm. feel pornographic or anything like that so I feel like you can start to see him as a filmmaker coming through and what he often does use 
um, when he's filming sex scenes or nudity today, even in his films. Yeah. Boxcar Bertha is a very artsy film. And I think someone mm -hmm. involved with the movie, like the distributor or something, they weren't really happy with Scorsese's work on this because it was too artsy. They were like, no, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. Because this was following Bloody Mama uh, from right. 1970, a Roger Corman film. And the studio wanted another movie about a female gangster, kind of in the same uh, mode of Bloody Mama. And I think mm -hmm. that Boxer Bertha, it wasn't quite as exploitative as maybe they wanted it to be. And it might have been harder sell for audiences at that time who were looking for kind of a follow up to Bloody Mama. Yeah. And I love the story behind like this this movie and with Bloody Mama because Julie Corman, Roger Corman's right. wife, she was the one right, who found this book and who really made that possible and mm -hmm. was thinking of, you know, coming at women's lib from a different angle mm -hmm. using this character. So I think that's a pretty unique story, but yeah, I mean, audiences at the time and Ebert even cites this in his review. He was a big Scorsese fan his whole life. And I, I think he, like he has a book called Scorsese by Ebert and he uh, I believe saw I Call First which was later uh, renamed Who's That Knocking at My Door at the mm -hmm. Chicago Film Festival and so I you don't really see very many negative reviews of Scorsese's work I think mm -hmm. The Color of Money I think is like might, might be the only one he gave thumbs down to if I remember right <laughs> And you know, that is one of the few Scorsese movies I have left. I have not seen that one. Oh, okay. Yeah, Another that's one, one of the lesser ones. saving one. for a rainy day. <laughs> it's fun to see Paul Newman uh, bring that character back from The Hustler. That was cool. And it's got Tom Cruise and it's it's got a lot of, fla a lot of flash to it. But that mm -hmm. was one of those films that he made, I think, at a point where he'd had a bunch of flops and he it was time for him to produce like a Hollywood, you know, moneymaker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, mm -hmm. you can kind of feel that in The Color of Money. Yeah. But Boxer Bertha, he gave three stars. Yeah. I think it's funny. He calls it a weirdly interesting movie. <laughs> I mean, I think <laughs> that's true. I mean, that, that is kind of how I felt about it too. I, I think when you go into it, you even, you know, we today in 2022 watching it, we know everything that we know about mm -hmm. Scorsese, the audiences at the time, of course, didn't know because he hadn't made those movies, he didn't have that reputation yet. Right. Um, but I was still expecting something that he would have little control over. And I think that one thing we think about when we think about Scorsese is that he has like full control over his medium, over everything that he's doing in whatever picture he's making. So right. knowing that that might not be the case here, I was expecting to for it to be just straight up exploitation. And it is strange. Like there, there are some interesting things that are happening there. I think mostly behind the camera with mm -hmm. editing, with certain shots that he's doing. And I think that, you know, Ebert was one of the people who mm. saw that. And another thing, of course, that Ebert calls out is just Barbara Hershey's performance, which I right. think without that, this film would feel like more of a standard exploitation mm -hmm. film or a film that you couldn't quite get on board with, because I do think it's essential that you have to buy into what your heroine is doing here and you have to believe her mm -hmm. in this role so I think that she she's fabulous in it and Ebert definitely called that yeah. out as well yeah it's not a cheaply made film like the production design mm -hmm. of this considering the small budget I think is pretty strong uh, showing the 1930s and mm -hmm. it, it seems like Scorsese did not actually choose the actors they like the actors were given to him but mm -hmm. I mean he he got three great three great four great actors in this movie if not more and uh, Barbara Hershey, this is one of her first films, and uh, she's just really striking in this. And then you have David Carradine. And then mm -hmm. you have Barry Primus, who was my acting teacher at Loyola Marymount University. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was in two of his classes my senior year. One was called Working with Actors, and then one was like a director's class for that like uh -huh. same topic. And I got to spend a year with Barry Primus, and it was like months into working with him that I actually finally looked him up in IMDb. And I went, oh my God, he's in two Scorsese films. He's also oh in God. New York, New York from 1977. Mm. So wow. that was, that, that was, a, thr that a, was a thrill to watch. I never, I had never <laughs> seen Boxcar Bertha mm -hmm. watching it. Like he looked a lot different in 07. <laughs> <laughs> great I'm guy, sure. great, great actor. He's in a lot of stuff. He's like friends with De Niro and he pops up uh -huh. in his work here and there. I think he might be in The Irishman. Is he in the Ooh, Irishman? Maybe. I should have looked that up. I think he might be in a scene of the Irishman too. Huh. But uh, yeah, so he his career goes back to the 70s as well. 
and he he has fun with his character too. <laughs> I really mm. enjoyed him in this. Yeah. So what do we think? What do we think of the cast of uh, of Boxcar Bertha? I think that the cast is really strong here. I think that you you do believe each of them in their roles. I think, like I mentioned, Barbara Hershey, she's really essential to making this movie work. I think she projects a certain type of innocence onto this character, but you can also, I think, believe the flip when that mm. happens, you know, when she starts taking control a little bit and, you know, moving through the rest of the story. I think that Carradine also you for that character to work i think you have to understand why people would follow him mm. why he would be yeah. um, a certain type of leader and i think the carradine um, does a really good job there like i mentioned hershey and carradine were dating in real life at the time had mm -hmm. sort of a tumultuous relationship but i think you can tell because i think they both have great chemistry um, in the movie and i think you know the rest of the cast too when you think about an exploitation film sometimes you're thinking about I don't know, actors who are sort of phoning it in or who don't have too much to do. But I think that our <laughs> cast here um, does a really good job. The, they weren't, you know, big actors who I was like, oh, I need to watch this movie to, you know, see the cast, to see Barry Primus, sorry, <laughs> or <laughs> Bernie Casey and what they're doing here. But I think that, I think that they, they sell their roles for sure here. Yeah, Bernie Casey, also really strong, obviously comes into his own in the last mm -hmm. scene of the movie. Yeah. And the way that his character is dealt with throughout the film is interesting too, like some of that racial tension. And mm -hmm. I, I really liked the ensemble that was put together here, even mm -hmm. if Scorsese might not have been the one who have chosen it. It could have been mm -hmm. worse, right? Like what if they had given him just four really lousy actors and he had to just make it work? It would yeah. not have been as good of a movie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you think about that because again, like I said, Scorsese is kind of known for having a certain level of control over his yeah. projects. But knowing like he was one of the last people to come into this, really, yeah. like everything was pretty much set, and he just was brought in to direct this. I think it's that's a big deal, and he he's lucky in a sense, right, that he already had some good bones there to mm -hmm. work with in the cast. But he took it seriously. Like I watched a mm -hmm. clip that were they talked about they arrived to the set. They arrived to the location and they went to his motel room and his entire motel room was covered with storyboards of every shot of the whole movie. Mm -hmm. He had been, he had been there for a few weeks before they started shooting and like, yeah. okay, that, that he's not, he's not just like, okay, this, I'm a director for hire. We'll just make do with this. Like he took it seriously. It was like, this could be, you know, the beginning of something really, really extraordinary. Even if the movie isn't maybe my best work, he clearly took the time. And I, I think you can feel that in the movie. You can feel that with the visual style. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And you can tell, you know, there is a certain level of creative freedom that he had there. And I love that he took it seriously. I love that he was, yes. I mean, I'm sure he was aware that this could be a sort of jumping off point for him to do the things that he really wanted to do later on. Mm -hmm. But also, I mean, taking, I think he really does as a filmmaker. And one of the reasons why I like him so much is because he takes his time. He really invests that much care into all of his projects. He's so detail oriented mm -hmm. and he knows ultimately that cinema is a visual medium. It's, it's all about the images that you see in front of you. And I think mm -hmm. if we're thinking about his collaborators as well here, um, our DP is John Stevens. And okay. I think that Stevens, he uses a lot of like French new wave techniques here that I thought were pretty unique and something that I think Scorsese harkens back to sometimes, but he also can stay away from that period, but he uses handheld, he uses some rack zooms, which are really neat. Um, lots of strategic edits. I love the split diopter shot that we get at the beginning. Oh, right. <laughs> um, so you get, I don't know, you get a lot the of- the one with carotene, like where you see like, mm -hmm. and then you see the background. Yes. Very yeah. Brian De Palma. <laughs> Definitely. And I, I love De Palma. I love De Palma. And he also was a student of Corman. So yeah. I think that you, you can definitely, you can see, I don't know, you can see some cool things that are happening here at the seams that you wouldn't expect from a movie like this. I always find it interesting. Like a lot of those guys were friends, right? They would hang out mm -hmm. and talk and like, imagine just being a fly in the wall. Like you got like Scorsese and Coppola and Spielberg and De Palma and they're like chatting. <laughs> like, yeah. I, like, like I would just Nuts. so, I would so, I would soak up right. Every second. Of mm -hmm. that. Oh so my fantastic. God. Yeah. I would just be totally just silent listening to everything, <laughs> everything that they have to say, but 
Yeah. I mean that, I think that's the best, the best thing about Corman. Um, mm. I think he's known a lot for these, these types of films, the exploitation like right. top films, mm. but really, I mean, he was a huge mentor to so many filmmakers, like all the filmmakers that you just mentioned. Yeah. Like being a mentor to Coppola and Scorsese, like that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the coolest thing. Yeah. He would give them their start. He'd give them a shot. He'd give them a little budget and go make this in 15, 20, 25 days, whatever it was. And, mm -hmm. and if, and, and usually, you know, when you look at these guys, you don't think, you don't think of Martin Scorsese, you don't think Corman. <laughs> right. But mm -hmm. really Corman played a small role in right. pushing him into the director and the position that he's been in for the last few decades. So mm -hmm. Roger Corman, I think we don't give him enough credit. Yeah. And we certainly give Scorsese a lot of credit, but if you think about that now, like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, you don't know which new filmmaker Scorsese is giving a chance to, when you see his name, right. As an EP mm -hmm. on something, um, you never know who that person could be in 30 years. Yeah, exactly. Now, mm -hmm. not everyone loved this movie. Did you? Mm -hmm. I'm sure. You, did you read the quote about uh, John Cassavetes, which is hilarious? Yes, I love that <laughs> quote because I, I do think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, maybe yeah. not as I don't view it quite as harshly, but yes, you should share that quote. So apparently, <laughs> Barry Primus was in the room when this happened, and Scorsese screened Boxcar Bertha for John Cassavetes. After seeing it, Cassavetes hugged Scorsese and said, "Marty." You've just spent a whole year of your life making a piece of shit. It's a good picture, but you're better than the people who make this kind of movie. Don't get hooked. Don't get hooked into the exploitation market. Just try and do something different. So something to that quality. And it really lasted with Scorsese. He might have gone on and make a couple more of these kind of films like Boxcar, but he took what Cassavetti said to heart and he went back to New York. I guess he was halfway through writing Mean Streets, but it wasn't like a for sure thing. But uh, that night with Cassavetes, he decided, you know what, you're right. I should probably go make a more personal movie. And that's what led to Mean Streets. So thankfully he screened it that night for John Cassavetes. Maybe we wouldn't have had Mean Streets. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's right. The, the power of honest feedback. I mean, if you think of the films that Cassavetes makes also, he's a very emotional and empathetic filmmaker who mm -hmm. is much more interested, I think, in the emotions of actors and um, the actor itself, not mm -hmm. so much in these flashy things that hook an audience. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of his films, I mean, if you tried to show a woman under the influence to a group of teenagers, <laughs> I'm sure they'd rather watch Boxcar Bertha or <laughs> one of these, you know, exploitation films. So um, but I think that Cassavetti's there, you know, with that, do I think it's a piece of shit? No, I, I, I think there's some merit to it somewhere, but I also think that Cassavetti's knows and could see those little things like, okay, Scorsese is the type of filmmaker who cares about his characters, who wants to tell a story in a way that is actually leaning away from the instincts that a mm. filmmaker who makes, makes exploitation films would have. And I do think Scorsese does use some of that in his films now, but there is a mm -hmm. certain sophistication to the violence that he right. um, employs in his films. Like if you think about even the age of innocence, something mm. that is really brutal, but not bloody, like right. that's much more akin to Cassavetes than your <laughs> exploitation films. Yeah, exactly. I, I can totally picture it though. I can see him like just having a smile on his face and patting him on the back. And mm -hmm. Scorsese's probably thinking, oh, he's going to compliment me. <laughs> and it's yeah. kind of a backhanded <laughs> compliment in a way. I don't mm -hmm. know. <laughs> oh, for sure. Right. You, you give the, that truthful, like mean piece of feedback there, but you have to end on the high note. Like, end on the high note. This. You can do this. You know, you've taught people before. That's always what you, <laughs> how you have to give feedback. Yeah. It's called the shit sandwich. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. <laughs> positive, positive, negative, positive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so funny. I mean, and it's like, I like, I can't imagine that Scorsese would have assumed that Cassavetes was going to say, wow, this is just great. Like you, you, mm -hmm. you would, he would have to know based on Cassavetes work and the films he had made up until 1972, that he would have kind of pushed against this kind of genre filmmaking. So it's right. not a surprise what he had to mm -hmm. say, but I'm glad he said it. He didn't sugarcoat. <laughs> Me too. Right. And I mean, he is like, if you think about Corman being one side of the indie filmmaker coin, Cassavetes is certainly the other. 
Yeah, so. exactly. So let's get into just our general thoughts. Like, so just overall as a movie, like, what did you think of Boxcar Bertha? I would say overall as a movie, this isn't really like my cup of tea per se, <laughs> like the, the films that I really love, but yeah. I did, I think I loved the performances and I loved watching this mostly just as a way to see Scorsese as a yeah. filmmaker, but I did love the length. It is very short. It moves at a brisk pace. And I think there are some scenes that are really strong in particular. I love mm -hmm. the opening. Yeah. I love like the, the message at the center of it. And like thinking about, um, this like liberal movement and mm -hmm. workers' rights. Um, but overall I do, you know, it was, it doesn't hold up as far as I would mm -hmm. say the other films of this year of this period, when I think about yeah. the seventies and what I love and, I think that's okay. I think that mm -hmm. this is a good entry point for a new filmmaker. And if you're a Scorsese fan, you should definitely watch it. But I'm not sure, I think, how well it holds up necessarily in 2022. Right. Yeah. I Yeah, this is not going to be one of the strongest films that I've watched for 72. It is kind mm -hmm. of like, it's a way to see early Scorsese. If he had not directed this, I don't know if it would be in the conversation much at all outside of maybe yeah. the actors in it. Because I, I found the first half a little dull at times. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it, it, there's not that energy you typically right. feel in a Scorsese movie, even a drama that he'll do. There's mm -hmm. not, there's not like a sense of danger. I wrote down in my notes at one point, I'm like, unlike Bonnie and Clyde, which obviously mm -hmm. has some similarities to this movie, Bonnie and Clyde, you really feel scared for them at any point of that movie, they're going to be shot down. Like there's oh, yeah. the sense of danger in every scene. And I didn't really mm -hmm. feel that in Boxcar Bertha when they were just, you know, the, like the light music will be playing and it'll be like a montage and they got, they're pointing the gun and, and mm -hmm. they're laughing and throwing the jewelry around. And there's not that sense of like suspense that I was hoping for from a Scorsese movie. It felt kind of odd for a while, but then I ended up, I would say I liked the movie overall because I thought the second half, it, it jumped into high gear and it got, and it got much more interesting. I thought the progression of Hershey's character, like, like, like her arc, especially mm -hmm. when after the death of the Barry Primus character and the way that like what happens to her and she kind of becomes like a prostitute, that whole mm -hmm. sequence was interesting. And then leading to a really just stellar final 10 minutes, I thought like a, like a mm -hmm. twist and it was frightening and it was powerful and the way that Scorsese directs the last 10 minutes I thought worked well so I'm definitely mixed on the movie overall but mm -hmm. not, sometimes if you if you stay patient enough a movie gets better <laughs> yeah and you know I mean it, it's 87 minutes long but yeah. <laughs> sometimes it does like I'm at the beginning I did kind of feel like okay like where is this going and I think this the stakes are supposed to be hi right you start with <laughs> the the death of her father yeah and in she's a plane all crash. of a sudden orphaned and those stakes again should be high like where is she going yeah what's what's going to happen here but the stakes don't feel high until you get to those more violent parts yeah. like, near the end and part of that i do wonder i think you know the the key relationship in scorsese's film life is that with his editor, Thelma Schoonmaker, right. and she's not here. And she yeah. is, I think, the one who really gives Scorsese's films that propulsion right. that like keeps you engaged and makes you realize like, okay, the stakes are high. This mm -hmm. is important. That kind of kinetic energy. And yeah. this mm -hmm. just doesn't have that at times. Yeah. It does have more of an easy breezy pace to it, mm -hmm. um, which I know is big in the <laughs> 70s, but it shouldn't be with this film. I feel right. that the pace is a little bit off for what this type of film is supposed to be. Yeah, editing makes a film. Like mm -hmm. if the editing, especially considering the genre, the style, if it's not, if it's a little off, I think you're right. If Shoemaker Shoon, had been a part of this, I don't think she didn't mm -hmm. come on board until A Raging Bull. Is that right? I don't think she mm -hmm. edited any yeah. of his seventies films. Like it feels she like she's there later. for Mean Streets or. Alice doesn't live here anymore, a taxi driver, but it, I think it was Raging Bull, which she won an Oscar for, I believe, for editing. Mm -hmm. And then she's, has she worked with him on every narrative feature since? I believe so. I think so. I think yeah. ever since Raging Bull, she's edited all of them. Yeah. And you can, like, there wild. is a, yeah, there is a style. Uh, 
It's Quentin Tarantino's editor who passed away mm-hmm. after Inglorious Bastards. Uh, her name is Sally Menke. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Like, like the style of her editing of his films, you can mm-hmm. tell there's something a little bit different from Django on. Like there is right. a certain style that these some of tell. these editors bring to their movies. Very yeah. important. I just watched. Think- uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, I think Thelma did do Who's That Knocking at My Door. I feel like they did. Oh, did the she do the first together? one? Because <laughs> it was like a student ad. I oh, okay. Like he answered an ad. She answered an ad in the student <laughs> paper. Um, but she, I know she didn't do this one. So that's that's funny though. And yeah, they I mean, worked together on Woodstock, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's but, interesting that he wouldn't have, maybe not for this because it was more of like a, you know, a Corman, Corman film and they had probably mm-hmm. edit together really fast. Yeah. I wonder why I've never, I, I didn't read up on that. I wonder why she wasn't a part of his uh, films from uh, Mean Streets to New York, New York. Kind of interesting. Yeah. I'm like, not what sure. Was she, what sure. was she doing in the 70s? I don't know. <laughs> you working on other films? <laughs> she might have been. Yeah. I, yeah. Maybe well, they had, maybe they had coming. a Killers of the Flower Moon. Mm-hmm. Very excited <laughs> for that. <laughs> Is that coming by December? I heard something uh, just a few days I, ago. It might not be ready until 23. I'm like, come on, really? I think he's always slow. Post, <laughs> so I feel like it's going to be 23. <laughs> wasn't the aviator meant, or not the aviator, uh, wasn't the Irishman meant for 2018, I want to say, but I then they pushed so. it to 19 and that didn't come out till November. Yeah. So mm-hmm. they take their time, but yeah, it's okay. Corsese is always worth the wait. Definitely. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But well, I was sorry gonna... for my aside. We can go back to <laughs> yeah. this. But movie. I was just gonna say real quick, I watched for the second time, I watched Tick Tick Boom again. Uh-huh. I just made I just made a video about Andrew Garfield's uh career and I watched that again because I just loved it and I wanted to see how it would hold up. I hadn't seen it since November. And I was uh-huh. paying attention the second time to the editing. Like the editing of Tick Tick Boom is so striking. And I'm like, you know, if this had been edited in just a normal fashion, there wasn't a lot of mm-hmm. jumping around. I think the movie would be good, but it's the editing that makes that movie so original and so alive. And mm-hmm. so, you know, just to say again about editing when it comes to Box Car Bertha, I think if you had had someone else in there to really make the movie move a little bit faster, give it some energy, I think it would have been a better film. Mm-hmm. I completely agree. And I agree with you about Tick, Tick, Boom. Also, <laughs> that was I that was my like sleeper pick to win the category. And I, I, there were some experts. There were some experts predicting Tick, Tick, Boom. And I'm like, doesn't yeah. have a picture. Sure. Nominee. <laughs> <laughs> I know <laughs> that was that was so fun. I love just like right before the ceremony, all of a sudden, everyone piled on to uh, uh, Penelope Cruz and I'm like no mm-hmm. oh, yep. <laughs> I think you get to, when it's in the, at the end of March right we're just all so bored we're like maybe it's not chest <laughs> right know? we're just tired and we want something more interesting to happen yeah. sometimes but wait maybe <laughs> yeah. it'll be Coleman <laughs> it's like oh I'm just no. it, it, the one nice thing about that show how terrible it was was I could finally just take a breath it was over <laughs> was like, yes exactly. I don't have to think about this season anymore <laughs> Uh, but yeah, going back to Boxcar Bertha. So we talked about the actors. We talk, kind of talked about our main thoughts of the of the movie. Anything else specifically about Scorsese and his direction of the movie you wanted to mention? Any other scenes that popped out to you? We're, we, de- I, we definitely mm. need to talk about the ending because the way that shot is really striking. Yeah, I think I would say the other than the ending, just the mm. opening, I think it yeah. just when we see Bertha watching her father fly that plane yeah. and he's a crop duster and you get that close up of Barbara like scratching her leg. Um, mm-hmm. That's very Scorsese there, I think. And just like seeing that like male gaze on her oh, right. um, from David Carradine and from these other men who are like on the railroad tracks, we get that split die after shot. Mm. Um, and then I love that smash cut to Barbara Hershey as, and then you get Boxcar Bertha, um, <laughs> That's the right, title yeah. card. <laughs> so I did like that. I thought that was a really fun way to open the film. Unfortunately, the energy just dipped from there. For me. Um, yeah. But yeah, let's let's talk about the ending. What did you like about the ending? You can. So yeah, so Carradine and Hershey reunite, and there is this sense of like they're going to be together, and then mm-hmm. those guys bust in and they take them out, and it's just like it's brutal. And they mm-hmm. they pin David Carradine up to this train uh, like a crucifixion with his hands, mm-hmm. like. And I don't know, like, how, if he is he still is he alive in the last shot. I get the sense that he has died by the time the train starts moving. I couldn't really tell. I don't know if you could. 
but yeah, it, so it didn't I, look good. <laughs> I got that sense too. And it was funny because I saw his feet kind of like propped up on something where I was like, okay, is this just because like, we're low budget here? Like we have yeah. like no special effects or like, are they just torturing him and he's somehow still alive? Yeah. I do think like at that point he has died by the very yeah. end. Yeah, um, I think so. It yeah, seems so like that's that last what I shot. Got. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I wasn't a fan of the, the makeup job on his cheek. That looked a little bit yeah. like, you know, that little chop of horror. <laughs> mm-hmm. That was like but, very, very low budget. But makeup. so much of the movie, you know, kind of moves at kind of a lumberous mm-hmm. pace and there's not a whole lot of excitement. And then uh, Bernie Casey shows up with <laughs> his weapon and mm-hmm. he blows these guys away. And the way that he shoots it almost at times, like we're in the POV of... Mm-hmm. the men getting shot like the camera like zooms back yeah. and it's a very quick quick uh cut and i'm like for a movie being shot this quickly i'm surprised that he was able to have the time to get experimental with those shots that it wouldn't have just been mm-hmm. like i mean he could have just had the camera on bernie casey and it could just been like boom boom and then cut to them dead <laughs> right oh totally but no and that's kind it's of like what I was it's like a dance it's like it's like this mm-hmm. violent dance of all these guys getting mowed down and it's and it's done just really like it's the kind of violence that I'm not sure many audiences had seen in 72. Yeah I thought I wondered about that too because that was unexpected to me but I did love that like the blowback of the characters like when you see that and you're like whoa this is all of a sudden incredibly violent and yeah yeah, not to say like I love violence in the movies but that felt much more like a Tarantino movie like something we would get later (laughs) on. Um, and he always has those fabulous endings that are just completely overly violent. Um, yeah. so it reminded me a lot of that, which I appreciated. Um, but yes, I mean that having that character crucified basically, mm. um, is so, so indicative of what's to come with Scorsese. I mean, if you right. think about the last temptation of Christ, um, even Goodfellas or mean streets, like Catholicism right. is always there. Um, whether mm-hmm. it's, up front um like something like silence he deals silence. with religion a lot um mm-hmm. whether it's something like that speaking of andrew garfield or <laughs> it's something that's just kind of in the culture for these italian americans who are often the characters i think that's where you you first see it for scorsese so it was cool i think to see that even though i was like oh wow this is what's happening here this is very <laughs> brutal and not what i expected for this character and seeing barbara hershey um, seeing Bertha just like laying there watching yeah. this happen is rough. Yeah. And the last shot is amazing of, of like the camera on the train as it starts moving. We, we're mm-hmm. very close up on David Carradine uh, crucified to this train and you see yeah. her running. And for a while, it looks like she's going to catch up. Mm-hmm. And then she just slowly, you know, can't quite mm-hmm. make it. And yeah. that's the last shot and it fades out. And it's not, it's not the kind of, final shot I feel like of a Roger Corman exploitation movie that would have uh, impressed audiences it would have been like what the hell is this you know right 50 yeah years ago. I wonder I wonder how they would have thought about you know this this is when the new Hollywood is coming up but a lot of these movies are going to end with much more ambiguous endings right um, that just if you think about Chinatown later on that just leaves you with this like pit in your stomach mm. at the end um, this feels, I mean, more like it's, we're heading in that direction where you yeah. just, you see her running, but you don't really get a resolution. A resolution. You're just mm-hmm. like, okay, that's it. What does this, <laughs> <laughs> what does this all mean? And I think because it's a Scorsese film, you can, you can try to dig deeper into that, but also knowing it's, it's a Corman film, it's, it's exploitation. You're like, maybe they just decided to end it here. And there's no, <laughs> there's just nowhere else to really look for the no, ending. No sequel. Yeah. Uh, boxcar so there is a clip of on on youtube of scorsese talking about working with corman and on boxcar mm-hmm. i was like there's gotta there's gotta be a clip of, of scorsese talking about this movie and it's like three <laughs> minutes but he said the hardest part of making boxcar was that he only had trains for the first four days of shooting oh, wow. so so that i would assume means that they shot this ending scene at the beginning of the shoot probably yeah. which would I have mean, been unfortunate you'd probably want to save that scene toward to later <laughs> not shoot like this violent uh ending uh right at the beginning of the shoot but i'm assuming that would have been one of those first four days it must have been really hard because he's just Mm -hmm. getting started on this movie that he only has you know 24 days to get the whole thing in the can yeah i 
I bet. Yeah. It's interesting to think like if they, if they put this in early into the film, it does establish a, a sort of not necessarily a tone, but you know, for the actors thinking of what kind of movie they might be making. And then if you think about shooting some of those other scenes that you get in the beginning <laughs> after that, you're like, okay, yeah. this is, it's a nice little break. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we get a little bit more violence. The the mm. killing of the Barry Primus character is very violent. Mm. He, yeah. What does he scream? He's like, not this time. I'm not going yeah. away again. <laughs> yeah. Something and then like he's that. just blown away, like outside mm-hmm. the train. And it's just like, mm-hmm. and it's got that lovely fake early 70s blood that I just adore. Oh, yeah. It's just like, so it's a certain type of red. We're just like, yeah, this is. It's like they strapped three giant tomatoes to his back mm-hmm. and just exploded them, you know? Mm-hmm. There, I, I kind of go back and forth on the blood. Sometimes when it's like fully orange, that's where I kind of check out, you know, like uh-huh. some, some of the horror films from the early seventies oh, yeah. where it just looks so uh-huh. fake. I thought it right. looked fine, but you can tell it's not real. Right. It's <laughs> like, it's not like by the time we get to Carrie where you're like, okay, this is a little bit more believable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If she was descending those steps at the prom in orange blood, it would not have been the same feeling. Mm-hmm. You know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Poor sissy SpaceX having to act with that all over. <laughs> mm-hmm. We will get to Carrie in a few years. Oh boy. Yeah. One of, that's one of my oh. favorite films. I love Carrie Me so much. Me too. So good. So let's see what else. Uh, I, I was a little bit disturbed. I don't know if that's the right word of, of uh, with uh, Scorsese's cameo where like, oh, he's yeah. like, he, like he's like her man for the night and he full on kisses Barbara Hershey in the scene as they get into bed together I was Mm -hmm. like that's kind of a weird director's cameo like I'm happy Hitchcock never did that super weird (laughs) yeah it's it's not the Hitchcock across the street that you get like (laughs) in the distance walking um like you see in rear window or any of those or like him in the apartment but yeah (laughs) That, that was an interesting choice because I didn't, I tried not to read anything about this movie going into it. Okay. I just wanted to like have yeah. a very pure experience watching it. And then when I saw young Scorsese and I was like, that's the role that you're choosing <laughs> here. Like you're just in this brothel. Like you're, you're putting yourself into the, um, the sex work plot of the movie. It's an interesting <laughs> choice. Um, but I mean, you, you really do, I think, and you'll, you've definitely already read some of these, I'm sure, or, and you definitely will coming up studying the future years of the seventies, the ways that some of these directors would like make the cast members comfortable or involve themselves in these productions. It just would never fly today. It would just be (laughs) a really strange, strange choice. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, like if Hitchcock had worked his way into a cameo in one of the two Tippi Hedren movies and he Mm -hmm. had forced her to kiss her on screen, that would have been a, that would have been a problem right yeah yeah it's it's weird it's <laughs> you know it's very so very it's not bizarre. something you see every day like usually mm-hmm. a director's cameo will be something a lot briefer or it won't actually involved involve you know mm-hmm. kissing the the lady I thought that was kind of a weird choice yeah I'm like like I wonder what the conversation was there like was he like I'm playing this role <laughs> I, I or did they not have someone too. on the day was it like the the fake baby and American sniper kind of a situation where the, where the, <laughs> where, the where the, the, the actor didn't show up and they said, we have to shoot it now or we can't include. And Scorsese said, you know what? I'll do it. <laughs> you know what? I wouldn't put it past them really. I mean, that, that feels like something that might've happened back then with right. the type of movie like this, where you're operating on a limited budget. You have a really short schedule to get things done. Um, right. And they had to, you know, fill that role somehow, but yeah, it's, I don't have an answer to that. I would love to know though, or maybe not. I don't know. But it's not to say this is his only film he appears in. He has a very memorable scene in Taxi mm-hmm. Driver a few years later. Like he's yeah. great in Taxi Driver. He's kind of that creepy passenger in the backseat talking to De Niro. And mm-hmm. he's in, uh, I'm trying to think, he's in other of his, like he doesn't, he doesn't show up in everything, but I feel like he'll pop in here and there. And, mm-hmm. and he's always, his mom's in a lot of his stuff. Oh right? yeah. Right? I love her in his movie. Yeah. Someone she, posted on Twitter. So someone posted on Twitter recently, like the like the person with the best filmography is <laughs> Martin Scorsese's mother. Because <laughs> of like like if you actually look at the titles that she appeared in, it's like the best list of movies ever. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, I'm sure. Like her Goodfellas cameo is great. Oh my god, um, but yeah, Scorsese. It's funny, like the taxi driver role that you mentioned, still kind of a seedy character that he decided to right play in that one so yeah I mean he's 
he's a fascinating guy and a bit of an oddball, I think, with like just the way that he thinks about his films and the roles in them. So yeah, well, now I need to know why he <laughs> why he was in this particular cameo. But yeah, before we move away from Scorsese and kind of a wrap mm-hmm. up our conversation on Boxer Bertha, just, you know, maybe yeah. a little bit more about Scorsese, kind of like, you know, like the role that he has played in your film watching life and you know Mm -hmm. maybe some of your favorite Scorsese films like do you remember the first one of his you saw the first one of his that I saw was definitely Goodfellas that was like the one that I had to watch I will say too like growing up my dad is Italian so like Scorsese is very important to us just like Coppola is um like anytime I think you grow up in an Italian American family like Scorsese is a hero to your family Mm -hmm. like those movies are important um I would say my favorite Scorsese movie is The Age of Innocence oh okay good one love that movie and I think Daniel Day Lewis and Michelle Pfeiffer just have like out of this world chemistry in it Mm. it's just so beautiful Mm -hmm. and I think it captures the essence of the novel very well and then I think the biggest Scorsese movies I remember like seeing as they came out when I was a bit younger, you know, I remember gangs of New York being a big deal, but not going to see it at the time. But then I remember like going to see the departed and that being a really big thing. And then of course that was the one that won best picture. And then I think the one that really like captured everyone like this came out when I was in college of course is the wolf of wall street yes I think Leonardo DiCaprio is one of his great collaborators I think Mm -hmm. they play off of each other very well and I think other older ones that I love I actually saw New York New York for the first time last year on a print that they had at the museum oh cool image what what, what was that like I thought it was fabulous. Mm. I had always heard like bad things about that one or that again, that that was like lesser Scorsese, but I thought it was really fun. I thought De Niro was great in it. I thought that Liza Minnelli, you know, there's a moment where she, when she sings New York, New York, and she looks just like her mother and it's made me cry. So (laughs) I love that one too. Um, But yeah, I mean, you can't really go wrong. Even the ones that people don't like as well, there's something to love. And of course I love the more serious ones too. I love silence. I love the Irishman. Mm. Yeah. It was mm-hmm. uh, so Sunset Boulevard was the first film you rented at age 10 at the library. Was Goodfellas, <laughs> Good, Goodfellas number two? Goodfellas, we had on VHS at home. Oh, <laughs> oh you already had it. So you watched it before mm-hmm. age 10. You were like age five. I, mm, I don't, you know, I definitely watched it early, like probably too young to yeah. really appreciate it. But I think the first time I remember really watching it and having it like, you know, sitting down in front of the TV and being like, you need to watch this movie was in middle school, like around the same time that I'd watched the Godfather in full. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I always kind of associated those two with each other, even though I do think the Godfather is far superior. Sorry, Marty. Two, two good fellows. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's tough. Those two are mm-hmm. high up there for sure. Oh, for sure. For sure. Like if I could only take one new desert Island, I think it would be good fellows. Mm-hmm. I think that movie just yeah. capital, capitalized everything I love about his work. Like the cast mm-hmm. is just like perfection. Joe Pesci in that movie. It's just on another mm-hmm. level. Uh, but yeah, I love Taxi Driver, Raging Bull. Those would mm-hmm. be two of my other favorites. And of course, all the really all the work he's done these last 20 years oh, from yeah. Gangs of New York to uh, to now. It's just been really striking. And he just, I love directors getting up there in their 70s and 80s and they just keep bringing it every time. Mm-hmm. They're just still just fresh. It's like Spielberg with West Side Story and these guys oh, that yeah. could just phone it in. You know, they're in their 70s. They could just like, do a couple more phone it in and they're not like they're they these films feel as fresh as they would have been if these directors were in their 20s and that just really fills me with joy mm-hmm. me <laughs> you know? too yeah absolutely i love love his later stuff and i cannot wait for killers of the flower moon yes back with uh dicaprio right and mm-hmm. is de niro in that too de niro's in it yeah. jesse plemons it'll be a great cast Ooh, yeah I hope it's out this year. I don't want to have to wait till November 23, right? I don't want to. That's a year and a half away. (laughs) Too long. (laughs) But yeah, as we wrap up uh, Boxcar Bertha, you know, I always ask um, our, you know, my guests at the end here, like, if they were to make this movie now, I would love to see Scorsese make this movie now. Mm. That would be interesting if he actually could like grab this, like, like take hold of the script, do Mm -hmm. a rewrite and make it something he would make today like what do you think this movie would look like today whether it was Scorsese doing it again or someone else like in mm-hmm. the 2020s what is Boxcar Bertha set in the 30s what, what does it look mm-hmm. like do you think 
I think it's a Tarantino movie. Um, <laughs> That's a good <laughs> so answer. I don't, I think Scorsese what's, you know, I would like to see him make it because a lot of his films actually don't have women at the center. Yeah. They're very mm-hmm. male, very driven. rare, and, male driven. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you'll have, you know, you'll have, it's somewhat fascinating female characters like, you know, Lorraine Bracco and Goodfellas certainly, but you don't have a woman at the center. So yeah. I would like to see what he would do there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think it's much more aligned with Tarantino's sensibilities. Right. And I would like to see, I think his riff on this movie and what he would do with, and he's very good at period films yeah. too. Um, I think it would be, it would also, I think he might turn it into more of a comedy mm. or like a darker comedy. It would have yeah. like more of those elements. It wouldn't. And I think it would move um, at that, you know, it would be much more dynamic. So yeah. I think that that's what it would look like. I think it would, it would be interesting too, with the politics, uh, making it today uh, mm-hmm. thinking about labor unions and that kind of thing. Yeah. I do think they would definitely have to change, um, some of the, you know, all of the things around like some of the, the race, um, mm. elements and how racist right. people are in the film. Mm. But I do think, one of the things that is progressive about it, the authorities in this movie are incredibly like violent and, and racist, maybe a bit much for like mm. how you would want to portray that today um, in a sense of just what you can show and what audiences want to see in their movies. Um, but the theme is so relevant and true to show mm. um, police depicted in that way and authorities um, depicted in that way that I think yeah. um, it could be really sharp commentary today. Um, but I think Tarantino would make it and it would be another, it would be an hour longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, what was the last film of his that went under two hours? Uh, Kill Bill oh. volume one. That's because we had to cut it down into two movies. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we'd be at like two hour, 20 minute runtime for this. I think even Death Proof, which was half of a movie with in Grindhouse mm-hmm. with Planet Terror by Rodriguez. I think like the director's cut of death proof is like two hours plus like it's he, he is not capable of a 90 minute film. <laughs> he's he's really not so yeah <laughs> that's okay I think though that, right and I, I feel like Scorsese would have would have an interesting take on it today and I would like to see that but I think it is it's much more out of his wheelhouse and what he's interested yeah. in making what what do you think film twitter would say if they announced a next the next Scorsese <laughs> film as a boxcar bertha remake <laughs> oh god you know i i can't predict what film twitter will say anymore but there'd I, be a I, lot of screaming <laughs> oh what? god yeah exactly no one would be happy i mean they never are but that would be <laughs> i mean it, ha- it happens rough. you know i mean not i don't I, I don't think it'd be this film but like alfred uh-huh. hitchcock alfred hitchcock famously remade the man who knew too much 22 years later and it mm-hmm. has happened in the past where a filmmaker who's much older and wiser says, I love that story. I can make it better today. So I, you know, not to say that I feel like today's filmmakers, I don't think, I think most of them want to do new things, right? I don't think there's any, unless you're Gus Van Zandt in the late nineties and you want to, you want to remake psycho. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) For the most part, it seems like the, you know, what they're interested in is new things, not going back to the past. So Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, that. I don't think, I think if they were to do Boxcar Bertha again, I think we, I, I would rather a take that's a little bit more closely focused on the Bertha character herself. Sometimes mm-hmm. she's kind of in the background, especially in the first half, just kind yeah. of part of an ensemble. I'd love a movie that's very like tied closely to her upbringing and her early life. And I think a great director could kind of push in on that. You, you, you said the right thing. His uh, Scorsese films are very male driven. I mean, the Irishman was like, it was like, mm-hmm. where is a woman? <laughs> like, can we find a woman? Right, right. <laughs> but uh, I do, I always tell people to check out Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. That's one of my oh, favorite yeah. Scorsese films. And it's an amazing Ellen Burstyn performance in that. Mm-hmm. Um, but for the most part, as much as he gets great female performances in his movies, it's it was nice watching Boxcar Bertha to see a film of his about a woman in the center role. Mm-hmm. I thought uh, Barbara Hershey did a good job. I'd give the movie like a, like a polite two and a half out of, four like a six out of ten i think it's worth watching if you're a fan of scorsese as a movie this is not one of like the essential films of uh, 1972 but it's Mm -hmm. better than you might think i went i put put this on thinking this will be kind of trashy and kind of disappointing considering it's scorsese and it didn't come off that way like it has 
it has more of an art house feel to it than you might expect. So it's worth a look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. <laughs> like everything that you just said, I, I would give it about the same rating actually. Yeah. Um, but was pleasantly surprised by it. Yeah. And yeah, I, I'm glad that I watched it and crossed Yay. it off my list. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't think either of us are sad, but that the movie did not get any Oscar nominations. I don't know what it would have been nominated for. Maybe like a I... production design. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Art direction. Like, <laughs> yeah. Grasping at straws. Like I, I, that's okay. The, his movies get plenty down the line. Yeah. I was thinking of doing a video series where I'd like review a bunch of new movies and talk about what could they get nominated for? And then I'm like, <laughs> what's the point? What's the point of talking about a new movie that has zero chance? Right. You know, yeah. like, uh, <sighs> like Sonic the Hedgehog 2. <laughs> oh my gosh. There's not yeah. going to be any Oscar nominations. So that's okay. And, yeah. And you know, we still know today, you know, like when you watch a movie and you know, it's not going to get any Oscar <laughs> nominations, just don't entertain it. Just yeah. appreciate it for what it is. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to remember. I, I forgot to look up if Mean Streets got any Oscar nominations. I don't think it did, but Alice doesn't live here anymore. Uh, Ellen Burson won Best Actress mm -hmm. for that film and Scorsese accepted the award. Yeah, uh, and um, then I do remember Taxi Driver got some nominations, and when Paul Schrader was nominated for First Reformed for Best Screenplay, it said mm -hmm. his first nomination, and I went, "Wait, what?" Like, like he, no. he he hadn't been because he didn't he write Raging Bull too. Yes, Paul Schrader yeah. either co-wrote mm -hmm. it or wrote Raging Bull. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa! Yeah. He wasn't nominated for Taxi Driver or Raging Bull for the script that's crazy to me <laughs> yeah it is and so paul schrader talk about another <laughs> better, better late than never for you paul for first mm -hmm. reform great film mm -hmm. but anyway that takes us to our final two segments the first one's called the divine double feature that's where we pick a more modern film to pair so you said before we started recording you have two what are your two mm -hmm. films to boxcar bertha it's a quick 87 minutes there's time for one more or maybe two more. What do, what do we suggest? Okay, so my first suggestion is from 1993 and that is True Romance. Ooh. So Quentin Tarantino, Tony mm -hmm. Scott film. Um, I think that this would pair really well um, just given, again, that exploitation mm. yeah. um, background Violence. there, but also mm -hmm. the relationship um, between the characters is pretty similar, I would say, yeah. um, in their motivations mm -hmm. to um, just kind of being drawn to violence together. Yeah. Um, I thought that would be a good pick. Uh -huh. And my more recent one is actually a horror movie, um, which I wonder if you've seen this, X. <laughs> have you seen Oh, X? I have. It's brand new, right? Brand new, yeah. With, uh, um, a Thai uh, West film. Yeah, one of the actors from the new Scream, I want to say, is like mm -hmm. the lead. The, the I can't remember her name. Je is it Jenna? Yeah, Jenna Ortega. Jenna Ortega. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Brittany Snow is in it, Mia Goth. Um, but there are definitely these like exploitation themes at play. Okay. Um, there's a woman at the center. Um, of course, you know, horror, you have your final girl, but it's final a little girl. bit um, deeper than that. Um, you have pretty graphic violence and characters who are like drawn into violence who didn't necessarily go there for that, you know, when they enter this world of the film. So if you want a movie, I think that's more closely tied, I would pick True Romance. But if you want a brand new film, I would oh, pick cool. X. So you could watch Boxcar Bertha at home and then, and it's in playing in theaters, right? X mm -hmm. is not streaming, Yeah, I think right? it's still in theaters. Yeah, it's an A24. Okay, movie. well, maybe by the time mm -hmm. this drops, it'll be available on streaming because movies yeah. go so quickly now mm -hmm. uh, to streaming. But uh, that's so great. I, I, I heard of the title once. It's definitely an under the radar film. It wasn't one I'd mm -hmm. really heard much about. And then I think I heard someone say something positive about it. And I, horror is my favorite genre. So I'm like, any anytime someone says something positive mm -hmm. about a horror film, I don't know. I'm like, <laughs> go find it. Yeah, you X. would like it, I think. It's um, it's also, it's it's very indebted to those 70s horror films, oh, okay. like Texas Chainsaw. Like it feels very much like that. But yeah. it's also like what was interesting, I think, thinking of like the, the nudity and the sex and the mm. violence in Boxcar Bertha, this film is like, it looks at, porn as a genre oh, so it's okay. interesting i think um to connect the two oh interesting so it's a good i love one. that idea yeah. mm -hmm. boxcar bertha followed by x i don't know about that title <laughs> is that the best movie to is that the best title to give your movie i feel like it's hard for people to find a movie called x 
Yeah, it's it may be not the best, <laughs> not great SEO. But. <laughs> SEO, exactly. Like give it like maybe one more word mm-hmm. and then it's easier to find. Because I feel like if exactly. you go on, if you just search for the film X, it might not be the, it might not come up. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's cool. I'll definitely check out that film. Mm-hmm. Uh, my choice, I was thinking of like the evolution of Scorsese. So I went with The Aviator in that mm. it's also a film of his with a, with a much bigger budget, more of a director's mm-hmm. stamp, also set throughout the 1930s. I thought it'd be kind of mm-hmm. interesting to see his evolution as a director over, so what would that be, 32 years, and to see how does he deal with just the period factor of a larger scope movie with a big ensemble in the same decade that uh, Boxcar Bertha is set in. So that was kind of like my idea. Like you can see his evolution yeah. over 30 years in terms of the setting and the, lo- and the not so much location, but uh, you know, that, that, that time period, he had so few resources with Boxcar Bertha. And then he has, I mean, what did, what did the aviator cost? Right. More than a hundred million? Oh my God. Yeah. It almost feels so, like unlimited resources for the aviator. I'd also feel like, is the aviator not as loved as his other films of the last 20 years? I feel like I don't hear mm-hmm. about the aviator that much. Mm-hmm. I feel like I hear some negativity about DiCaprio's performance that he's a little bit young to play Howard Hughes. Yeah. And so I, so I, I get that, but I, I've seen the aviator a couple of times and I, I've really enjoyed it. I love movies about Hollywood history and Mm-hmm. I think uh, Kate Blanchett's great as Catherine Hepburn in that movie. I that's, do too. That's my favorite part of that film. It's, it's uh, Kate Blanchett. And, For uh, sure. It's not a perfect film. It's not one of his best, I would say, of the last 20 years. But it's, it, I, I really enjoy The Aviator. It's, it's an interesting film. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really unique um, double feature. I didn't think <laughs> about it that way. But I, I like that. I'm thinking of like the evolution of Scorsese and the time period there and yeah. the comparisons could be could be fun i mean the, the aviator is a little bit longer so you're in for a for a long oh, night yeah. but it'll uh-huh. be worth it <laughs> mm-hmm. i actually have no idea if anyone's ever taken any of my uh double feature ideas i'd love just one tweet one message some hey last night boxcar and x thank you sophia mm-hmm. come on yeah. just one of you let's yeah, do this go ahead <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome mm-hmm. all right that takes us to our final segment beyond the flick uh, I'll do a deep dive into Scorsese next year when we get into Mean Streets, which is kind of his first big personal film. Uh, but today I wanted to talk about Barbara Hershey, an actress I love, who's still active today. 50 years on, she's still in film and TV and has done great work over the last five decades plus. Um, so if you had like, like, are there two or three other films she's appeared in that you can talk about that you like that you've seen before? Yeah, so I think the first one I will talk about is the most recent one of hers that okay. I think people would recognize Barbara yeah. Hershey from, especially if you follow the Oscars. And that is of course, Black Swan. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> where she plays Erica and she wasn't nominated for an Oscar for this, which I thought was sad because she got a BAFTA nomination and she was nominated as part of SAG Ensemble. Okay. But um, I think that she, she's so creepy in this movie like there's just something (laughs) about her and the way that she talks to um natalie portman's nina in this movie that i just i really like and i think this might have been the first movie where i saw barbara hershey and it's like who who is that (laughs) Mm -hmm. like there there was definitely something to her um that i really responded to there i would say another movie that i think is Um, sort of under discussed and I'll talk about it because we had a Jane Campion film this year um, but that's the portrait of a lady Mm -hmm. Um, Barbara Hershey is in that as well and um, she plays this character Serena who is quite interesting I will say (laughs) and um, I you know I highly recommend if you liked Power of the Dog or if you didn't like the Power Mm. of the Dog still going into um, the films of Jane Campion and this Mm -hmm. one also just has a great cast uh-huh. um, seeing Barbara Hershey with Nicole Kidman, um, Shelley Duvall's in it, Richard E. Grant. I like love Shelley it. Duvall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Me too. Oh my gosh. As an Altman, Altman girl. I love Shelley Duvall. She's yeah. one of my all time favorites. Um, but this one, yeah, I think if you like um, costume dramas, if you like period films um, with a little bit of darkness yeah. to them, this one's really good. And my last one, which is, oh my gosh, this is my favorite Barbara Hershey performance for sure. And 
my favorite Woody Allen movie. It is Hannah and her sisters. Mm-hmm. I love this movie. I rewatched it yesterday. Um, again, oh, you did? <laughs> like to prepare for this. I was like, well, I watched Boxcar Bertha. I need to pick another Barbara Hershey movie to watch. <laughs> and even though I've seen, and I was going to pick something that I hadn't seen in a while, but then I saw the length of the right stuff, which I do love. I do like the right stuff a lot, but I was like, okay, mm, okay I don't need to rewatch that. Um, I will rewatch <laughs> Hannah and her sisters. And I think she's just fantastic in this movie and the way that she acts opposite um, Michael Caine in yes. it is so, so good. And just the, the script and again, like Boxcar Birth, I think you completely believe her character and everything that she is going through in that movie. So, so I would I, say those three. I'm not sure if this has ever happened before in this podcast. I have three titles. Uh, those were the three. Oh my god! <laughs> that's, that's kind of that's we kind matched. of amazing. That's kind of amazing. Wow. Like like, and you went in the order too. It was like very oh. surreal for me just now. I'm like, wait, yeah, that's yes, so funny. We are <laughs> the same Aligned. brain when it comes to this. <laughs> Absolutely, those wow. are my three too. My favorite mm-hmm. film of Woody Allen's is Hannah and Her Sisters. I know everyone says Annie Hall and some of his early comedies. Mm-hmm. I think Hannah and Her Sisters is just a beautiful film. Great ensemble. Mm-hmm. I love Barbara Hershey in that. Her yeah. chemistry with with uh, Michael Caine is just on another level and the Mm -hmm. way that like he's married to Mia Farrow right yeah but he's but he's now interested in the sister (laughs) played by Barbara Hershey Mm -hmm. Diane Wiest is so great the best so good Oscar winner for supporting actress she won Mm -hmm. supporting actress twice for a Woody Allen movie she later won for uh, Bullets Over Broadway and uh, Michael Caine won best supporting actor Oscar for mm-hmm. Hannah and her sisters and yeah Barbara Hershey is kind of like the unsung like I would have nominated her too I think she's great in it Me she's too. got such a vitality in that movie and yeah I love her in that and then Portrait of a Lady I feel like is essential viewing because that's her to date one and only Oscar nomination mm-hmm. for supporting actress that was my first uh, Oscar video I did it about the supporting actress race of 96 and looked at the uh, Portrait of a Lady again and was just really stunned by her performance in that I think she works really well in Jane Campion's world and mm-hmm. with uh, Nicole Kidman, I feel like that movie was kind of meant to be uh, like a big Oscar nominee winner of the, it was mm-hmm. an end of the year release, but there were a lot of big end of year dramas in 96. Not every, not all of them could make it, make it through. And I think that one was yeah. just a little bit it, it, like people liked it, but it wasn't like overly adored at the time. Mm-hmm. So Hershey was its big nomination. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It definitely deserved more though. Oh, 96 yeah. is an interesting year at the Oscars. <laughs> oh, I watched your video on this. Because oh, did this you watch the year? This is the Lauren Bacall year. Lauren Bacall, right? Julia yes. Binoche. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. One of the, yes. I mean, maybe the most shocking win in yeah. the, the acting categories still big. to date. Like uh-huh. it was one of the big ones. Yeah. And I feel like because we talk about precursors all the time, Lauren Bacall mm-hmm. won everything. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And she was yeah. basically being told by everybody in the weeks leading up to the night, you're win- you're going to win. So you better prepare a speech. And this is like, she's like a legend. She's been in the industry for 50 plus years. And she had her whole family with her. I mean, it was just a very mm-hmm. difficult experience. And then Juliet Binoche, all she does is go up and say, well, I thought Lauren was going to get it. Bye. <laughs> so yeah, it's so like, rough when that happens. <laughs> And that's, uh, Binoche would go on to be nominated for Shock of Law, but she really hasn't played a big part in, you know, Oscar mm-hmm. ceremonies, hasn't been nominated very much. So that would kind of turn, I mean, we'll see what happens. I think Julia Binoche is an extraordinary actress. I hope she's back nominated soon. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, that was kind of like her big Oscar moment. And it just, it, it was like definitely worthy of a video to talk about like yeah. how this all broke down. And I don't think Barbara Hershey ever really had a shot because she hadn't won any of the major precursors, but I love that mm-hmm. she is an Oscar nominee and I, and I love her performance in that. And then Black Swan. I think the problem there was, I for, I'm glad you mentioned that she got a BAFTA nomination because I, for, I forgot about that. I always think about Mila Kunis because she was nominated at the Golden Globes mm-hmm. and at SAG. Didn't she get an, yeah. didn't she get an individual SAG nomination for supporting actress I, Mila Kunis I think that's I think that's I think right she because got both she, nominated that movie also I remember people thought that it was going to be just this like this movie that got 10 Oscar nominations <laughs> like it was going to be a huge deal yeah. I think it got like five or six I think yeah. it was smaller it, than people thought but I'm yeah Mila Kunis yeah she did she got a supporting actress individual nomination at SAG 
Because I remember thinking, like, when you get it at Golden Globe and at SAG, usually mm-hmm. <laughs> you make it yeah. in. But every year, I feel like one or two people miss, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they get mm-hmm. they get close, and then they just, uh, same year, uh, Andrew Garfield again. He was mm-hmm. nominated for Social Ooh, Network. That one, oh my goodness. I, <laughs> yeah, that one's really, really tough, because I always, I always, like, in my mind, think that his first nomination, nomination was like before tick tick boom with social network not hacks all red yeah i think that that they so and i talk about in the video john hawks was the surprise oscar nomination for supporting actor that year for mm. winter's bone i think mm. if john hawks had missed i think it would have been garfield i i would bet garfield was number six i think he was uh, close mm-hmm. but thankfully he's gone on to have an amazing career these last 12 years and to get two yeah. nominations um, bigger fan of his nomination for Tick Tick Boom than I am Hacksaw <laughs> Ridge. But the fact that he's not even 40 yet, he's a two time Oscar nominee, very cool. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I think Barbara Hershey, she she's so delightfully creepy in Black Swan, but in a realistic mm-hmm. way. It's never like overly dramatic, right? Like it, right. in the hands of Darren Aronofsky, you can't you can't push it too far. You push it just far enough. And Black Swan was my second favorite film of 2010. That was just an amazing year for movies. Uh, my third favorite social network. And my favorite, b- because I wept like a baby both times I saw it at the end, was Toy Story 3. I just love Toy Story oh, 3. <laughs> I, yeah. I just think that that's maybe my favorite Pixar film of all of them. But that's what a great, a great year for movies. And she, she was in two great kind of suspense films that year. Uh, the other one it was number 10 on my top 10 list was Insidious. Uh, Barbara Hershey is also in that. I almost (laughs) mentioned that one. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think it, I I don't think it actually came out. Like, I I think it actually came out in theaters here in early 2011. So -hmm. it was like a little bit, maybe, maybe I guess you would call it a 2011 release, but it Mm -hmm. first started screening in 2010. And she's really good in that too. The biggest jump scare of the whole movie is when she's telling a story at a table and it's on Patrick Wilson. And then you see like the red devil behind him like with his eyes yeah. open and his teeth out and like, and she just jumps out of her chair screaming. It's just a great reaction uh-huh. from Hershey in that moment. <laughs> Insidious is scary. It's a I, scary movie. I had forgotten how scary it was. And I rewatched it like during like early quarantine right. time when I was just like going through all my horror <laughs> movies that I was watching to remind myself that other people have it worse than I did at the moment. <laughs> um, and yeah. I was just shocked at how scary that was. And that jump scare in particular, was like, oof. I mean, I might go as far as to say Insidious might be the scariest PG-13 horror film. Mm. It's not yeah, rated R. That. It's wow. rated PG-13. I remember seeing it in the theater oh and I was like turning away from the screen and I'm like in my mid twenties, yeah. like freaked out. And I'm like, 13? <laughs> yeah. You know? It's like Poltergeist yeah. getting a PG rating back in 82. Mm, like, how'd nuts. that happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's a discussion for another day. Mm-hmm. The other two the other two I would mention would be Last Temptation of Christ, just because it is a Scorsese mm-hmm. film. That'd be kind of an interesting pairing, too, with Boxcar Bertha to see her working with Scorsese again, also with The Crucifixion and some mm-hmm. of the similarities to Boxcar. And then one of my mom's favorite movies, I don't know if it's one of my favorites, but it's an enjoyable film, and that's Beaches with... Uh, Bed Midler, I know, is a beloved oh, yeah. film of many, and that's also Barbara Hershey. I thought I'd mention that one as well. Definitely, um, <laughs> that was on that was on my list too. Bet Midler, you gotta put it on there somewhere, but not my top three. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, definitely, mm-hmm. Hannah and her sisters, Portrait of a Lady, and Black Swan, three mm-hmm. just excellent, excellent films. What a career she has had. This has been such a blast, Sophia, to talk to you today about Boxcar Bertha to have you on the podcast uh we talked uh, with you and nick uh boy what is that a year year and three months ago we talked about yeah. the academy awards ceremony of 1970 so go back into the archives and find that that was a really fun conversation mm-hmm. as well and you I, I was so excited to be invited onto your podcast oscar wilde a few months ago uh mm-hmm. to talk about uh the the uh, early 70s oscars and just it's such an extraordinary time for cinema for the academy awards I, I love this time in, in film history and uh, it's just always great to explore it with great guests like you, Sophia. Oh, thank you so much for having <laughs> me. It was so much fun to talk about this film today, Boxcar Bertha and also Barbara Hershey and just to think about like films at this period in time. Um, definitely yeah. one of my favorite times to talk about movies and 
um, yeah, definitely go back and listen to that episode where we talk about Patton and <laughs> yeah. Nick's, Nick's favorite movie, Airport. Airport. <laughs> I might have made fun of Nick mm-hmm. a little bit because oh, yeah. I don't think he I loved it, right? But he he yeah. had some affection for Airport. Yeah, he did. More so than like MASH and Five Easy Pieces. So <laughs> <laughs> He liked Airport more than Five Easy Pieces? I believe so. From from what I remember, I'll I'll feel bad if I get that wrong. But you can we can people listeners, you can fact check that. But yeah, five easy pieces. My favorite film of 1970, and the first film I talked about on this podcast back in September 2020. Oh, five easy pieces. One. one of the greats of the early 70s. So yeah, Definitely. Sophia, I'd love for you to talk about Oscar Wilde. If you have anything to promote, uh, let our listeners know where they can find you online. Yeah, definitely. So I host a podcast called Oscar Wilde with my friend and co-host Nick Rookrout, and we cover films of the past. So we do great retrospectives Mm -hmm. on directors. Um, We cover Oscar rewinds where we'll go back to different best picture years. And then we also cover the current season. So Mm -hmm. new movies that come out and dive deeper into individual categories during Oscar season. We're about to kick off season three. By the time this episode airs, we might've already done so, but our first, um, our season three premiere will be a celebration of The Godfather, one of my favorite movies. So (laughs) I can't wait to share that with everyone. So definitely check that episode out. We release episodes every Thursday and you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Oscar Wilde pod. Cool. Well, I can't wait to check out your Godfather episode and excited to see everything that you and Nick are going to do in the months to come. I love your Mm -hmm. podcast. It's one of my must listens. When I drive to to and from work, I love seeing what you guys are up to. And again, I'm just really impressed with all the work you're doing, Sophia. It's just just fantastic. Oh, thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you again for having me on. So thanks for being here. Thanks to all of you for listening. You can find us online at filmat50.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And check out my new uh, YouTube channel, Brian Rowe Video, talking about the Oscars and film history. That's at Brian Rowe Video on YouTube. Until next time, remember, 50 never looked this good.